So my name is Mike. I'll explain more about who I am and what I'm up to later. But first, let's start with uh, kind of the obvious question. Why hire a developer when you can hire a barista and teach them to code? So to start with, why hire a uh, person at all in the first place? And I did a little math on the plane. And I know there's some huge companies here, so this is a, a paltry number in comparison. But I think, I've, I think I've hired about 23 people in the last six years. And most of them are developers now. Most of them were not developers when they started. The only good reason I've ever had to hire anybody has been uh, I can't do it by myself, basically. I, I get stuck with timing or with scheduling or I just don't know how to do something and I find someone who I think is better at that than me and then I, I hire them in some way. And there's a few different ways to kind of like actually hire someone, right? There's kind of the, the traditional model of let's build a full-time team, W2 employees, you know, whatever. It's pretty expensive but you build kind of the internal talent and it's great for the business the expense can be prohibitive, especially for some smaller companies, and even just smaller projects at larger companies. The other option that happens a lot and sometimes doesn't actually turn out super great is when you start with a prototype, maybe get that built by a third-party team, maybe a shop, and then hire one or two more junior people to maintain it. And I've seen that kind of go badly a couple times. It also is possible for it to work. And then the other option is complete outsourcing of the entire engineering task, right? So I can guarantee you Mark Zuckerberg is not personally managing every engineering team at Facebook. He's outsourced that task to someone else at his organization. And you can also do the same thing, of course, like with another company. And that's what we do. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Sales Company, which is a digital studio, but basically a dev shop, design shop, product shop. And lately what we've been doing is specifically that, just kind of like taking over the entire uh, engineering challenge. Maintenance, red phone services, uh, middle of the night calls, production deploys, et cetera. Um, I'm also the creator of Sales.js, a MVC framework for Node.js. Okay, so when I look at hiring, I kind of see engineers specifically, right? I see like three buckets. And there's so many ways that you can describe developers. There's like, there's a junior developer though, and there's a senior developer, and there's a lead engineer slash architect, which are kind of like decent labels that you can at least classify in terms of the number of dollar signs. So up here going my or your right to my left, um, junior developer is going to be the least expensive, and elite developer is usually going to be a little bit more expensive. What we've tried to do is kind of dial that back a little bit more. Um, so you can see, like, the, the junior developer is like, kind of lumpy, looks like a kidney bean. And the senior developer is starting to get a little bit more well rounded. And then elite developers just seen a lot of stuff, right? And so they, they have a lot of experience. It may not all be applicable, like, 90% of it probably won't be applicable. But when something new comes along, which it does inevitably, it's going to be OK. But what if we like shift further and start with the literal barista, right? the blank slate? They know pretty much nothing. Uh, a lot of times they can use Google Calendar, which is great when you can find that. Um, and they have to learn everything from scratch. No terminal skills, no text editor skills, barely any knowledge of how to open different browsers. Right, in a lot of cases, and like doesn't matter because people learn so quickly. Um, and what we try to do is kind of get people into the, what we call it like a trainee status in a little over a month. And that doesn't mean that they can like write code that we're gonna trust or anything like that, but it means that they basically understand what all of this stuff is, right? To the point where soon they can be what we call an apprentice, which is someone that is gonna be submitting pull requests, not you know, writing a lot of code is going to go straight to master. And what this has done for us, at least, is create this kind of culture of teaching, where 
because there's so many people around, there's so many baristas or sandwich slingers or uh, dorm room uh, managers, et cetera, around, like, everything we do has to be boiled down into an explainable nugget. So you might be uh, looking at, I don't know, two different kind of re like requirements, right? And you, you hand a very small task off to this, this new developer. And 90% of the time, they're going to mess it up at the beginning. But every single time that happens, it's an opportunity to teach, basically. And in teaching, we're also defining our like, coding style guide and constantly updating it. And without having those guys around, I don't think that we would actually ever do that. Another thing that happens is it kind of helps with retention, right? Because now you have this bond that's developing between the apprentice and the master, and you have the uh, kind of ongoing relationship that they build, and also just this feeling that like, hey, I'm getting something out of this company, I'm learning something, or hey, I can't leave the company because I need to take care of this person that I care about and I've been helping. And you know, it goes both ways. So obviously, teaching is great. Um, we all want things to be done, though, like relatively quickly. And all of this teaching can definitely slow things down. So what we've done to try to minimize the impact of that and try to create a net benefit is to just capture business value as soon as possible along the way. So maybe a barista initially right, can't really write a lot of like, JavaScript code. But they can totally go into like Zoho CRM and like set up some workflow rules, right? Or they can go in there and they can update the sitemap when a new page gets edited. And yeah, it's kind of annoying to explain all those steps to them, but in doing so, you've actually taken the time to communicate about it, which you might never have done otherwise. And they're effectively acting as our project managers, right? They're, they're forcing, I'm a bad project manager. I don't ever talk about anything. I just code all day, right? And so having these people around is like a way to force the technical team to manage itself. The other side of this is that business needs are not static. So every day, more stuff kind of appears in this constellation of requirements that we, that we build um, over time. And if you have an entire team that's composed of generalists, right, or people that you're hiring because you need to move faster. Obviously, there's some big problems with that as far as collisions and people pulling on each other and different opinions. And you have to like build all these processes to solve that. But something that's worked really well for us is just like by having people there in the middle that have to understand what's going on, you, you force agreement. And as you, you know, no matter how experienced someone is, there's always going to be certain requirements that are out of reach for them, basically. And the best kind of team, really, as a whole, but even just a developer, can reach out and like grab those requirements and just figure it out. Like maybe someone's not going to be able to, to figure out how to do CRISPR, right? Like I don't, I'm not going to know how to do CRISPR or like build hardware from scratch. But like I can, I can Google some stuff and figure out who I need to talk to to get a hardware prototype built. And we're paying these developers to grow like this anyways, in reality, right? Like, no matter how experienced you find someone, they're going to be learning new stuff all the time at work and getting paid for it. So why don't we start at day one with that and let people grow their entire careers um, as technical kind of uh, I don't want to say savants, <laughs> but everyone out there is capable of creating really great stuff. And you don't have to be a genius to do this. Um, I'm certainly not. And I was a barista myself about nine years ago. So, Any questions? Uh, I'll start from left to right. Hi. Um, it sounds like you had um, pretty, it was a success with your, your methodology. It's very interesting to me. And I would like to know um, from your experience when you hired these baristas, what were the qualities that you found over the years 
that made these individuals to be successful in this process? Yeah, so just to be completely honest with you, I've only hired two baristas, but there's been other, you know, sandwich shop, Thundercloud, Whataburger, you know, kind of done, <laughs> run the gamut. Um, something that really helps is if you can find someone that's had customer service training from an organization you respect. I still, to this day, rely on the customer service training that I learned at Starbucks. And just, just the truly understanding, like, what does it mean? Like, if you can get away with it, the customer is always right. Like, taking care of people, having empathy for them. Um, that, by itself, is probably the biggest, the single biggest thing. I mean, I, uh, oh, oops. If you uh, talk to me after, I can show you some of the stuff that we, that we kind of go through. Like, one of my checkpoints is like, hey, like, could you make it to the first meeting on time? If not, that's cool, I'm late usually. Uh, but what about the second meeting? Like, as long as you can make it on time to one of those, like, all right. Thank you. Hey, great talk. Have you found it challenging to price your services as you grow so dynamically, so you make a profit? Yeah, uh, so we, we, when we got back into services after uh, Y Combinator, um, we ran out of money, so we kind of had to be profitable <laughs> pretty quick. Um, that's the reason we got back into services. Um, and actually having, uh, I don't want to say lower skilled, but more entry level people um, only helps because people love to calculate by the hour. We don't charge by the hour, but people love to think about pricing by the hour. And if you take our team average for the hourly rate, it's very low because there's so many baristas. <laughs> Hi, um, do you have any data uh, that you can share on how much is this costing you? Because it's not free to bring baristas into senior devs. And also, I'm interested in knowing what is the split between baristas and oh, baristas or sandwich shop workers and, and more senior and architect people? So right now on the active project we have going 50-50. Um, I, I should say, so we're one that's sort of like very bottom of the apprentice level um, in kind of getting to the, uh, we have someone that can do HTML and CSS, uh, great with Flexbox, totally gets it, um, can deploy to production, can do all of the DevOps stuff that you need to do on Heroku. Uh, and then we have someone who came from a boot camp, so kind of they were further along already, and we sort of just spent, I think now it's been a month or two of, uh, of training on top of that. and. On that team, that's been like a really, that's been a really good split. We have a senior developer um, and then myself who uh, is kind of like half senior developer and then half of the time I'm just, I'm doing non-technical stuff, getting the requirements boiled down from the client. Um, as far as data, it's pretty subjective right now just because we're so small. Um, but the, I can say for sure that we're making more money than we were last year. Uh, well, I had the same question, but I'll just ask another one. How big is your group right now? Uh, five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> What's your interview process like? Recruitment process, you said? Interview process. Interview. Um, not much of a process. Uh, that, that side of things, I'm definitely not. Like, uh, you know, I've never had to mass hire. Like I said, I've hired 23 people in the last six years. It's always been a matter of just kind of like getting to know someone on a personal level real briefly um, and seeing if they would be someone that I could communicate with effectively. And then, like I said, just seeing if they show up on time. Basically, I don't, I don't do much of an interview process at all. I just schedule a few meetings to talk about stuff and see if they show up and continue to impress me with their soft skills. So when you're talking about velocity, um, at what point, if ever this has happened, do you say maybe this isn't worth it, maybe they're not learning fast enough? Um, like, do you ever have a cutoff point when you're kind of thinking you're spending too much money and time? The only time that's happened has never been because it's taking too much of the senior people's time. It's always been because uh, we didn't review their code enough, <laughs> the junior people's code enough. 
Um, it's, it's always more about quality and stability, and it's less about time being taken from the senior people. Basically, every time that that time suck happens, not every time, but I guess a lot of the time, there's other good that comes of it. Like, in that code review process, it forces maybe to say, like, you know what, like, how should that be done? I don't know, I never thought about it. <laughs> and so just having that kind of uh, ongoing communication is, uh, has, that the time suck has never been a problem for me. Hi, how do you handle teaching the same things over and over again? Uh, so far, with this kind of batch of recruits, I haven't really had to, because what I've noticed is that they start teaching each other. Um, so at this point, like Rachel, our senior dev, she does, she was actually my personal assistant in 2012, so she's at this point gone through the whole gamut of English major, uh, going into buying groceries before you could get, you know, Instacart or whatever. And, uh, to doing bookkeeping, to doing HTML and CSS, to becoming just amazing at HTML and CSS, to becoming amazing at DOM development, and becoming amazing at literally doing everything. <laughs> so it's, she teaches, uh, she teaches Raquel, Raquel teaches Mark, Mark teaches Raquel. Um, it's kind of a, it's a positive cycle, and I found that actually as more time goes by, I, I have to do less and less. Are you uh, teaching clean slates to use Postman? And uh, to your experience, how long does that take them to gain a, a reasonable mastery of the tool? Uh, yes, yeah, so for, for sure, I, I almost wish Postman was easier. Um, I wish there was like a dumbed down version that like you put it in like easy mode. Not for them, but for me, because I'm just really bad at everything with HTTP, and I forget how it all works every time. Um, and, and for usually the kind of stuff we're doing, like. The difference between it being like a URL encoded body or like a JSON encoded body, like it's going to get parsed into the same thing anyways on our back end because we're using sales. So, uh, you know, that's my only kind of like rub against it. But yeah, I mean, we use Postman anytime we have to integrate with any other API. I have them start with that and then we'll walk backwards into building helpers, um, like a little utilities to call out to it. Uh, just a question on the methodology. You said you hired 23 people over six years? Right. And you're down to, and you have five. So in this methodology of, of training these people, kind of what is that evolution of? Clearly it seems to be an evolution of they're there for a while and then they move on. Is that kind of the model you're, you intentionally have? Um, well, we didn't really land where we're at now until we rebooted the services business. I mean. In 2015, 2016, we were locked at five people because I was trying to keep our burn as low as possible. We were burning through like about 700K. So we were burning, I think, less than 20K a month, um, just being as lean as possible. So you kind of take two years out of that equation because we didn't touch anything like that uh, at that point. Um, as far as the, as far as like the churn, obviously Rachel stayed, Gabe uh, wanted more money and moved on and he deserves it. Um, there is a missed revenue opportunity for me to place people and take a recruiter fee that we should be taking um, when they get to that point because we can also, I think, help people find better placements. Um, but yeah, there is, there does come a point when it's like when people start to realize that, uh, hey, like I'm worth like a lot of money now, this is awesome. Um, and I'm trying to be upfront about that from the beginning now and ask people to kind of for a, a handshake like, hey, let's, Give me two years. Thank you.